Hi, welcome to another episode of Analyzing Mormonism. This is episode seven, and I'm here with America. Hi. And we are going to be reading off different accounts of the trial that Joseph Smith went to in 1826. On March 20th, 1826, Joseph Smith was brought to trial for being a glass looker. And we have several different court notes that detail what happened at the trial. The first one she's going to read is called uh, Mormonism. It, it's from the New Schaff Herzog Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge. This article was published in New York in 1883. And another account is from Judge Neely's Court Notes from Frazier's Magazine, published in 1873, and it's pretty much word for word the same as this other one. So we have two nearly identical accounts, and then we have a third account that comes from William D. Purple, and it was published in the Shenango Union on May 2nd, 1877. And there's a last one that I want to read that I don't, I'm confused about the dates, so I'm not sure if it's a reflection on the 1826 trial or if it's a different trial altogether, but I'm going to include that at the very end. So this is me reading the one from 1883. People of the State of New York versus Joseph Smith. Warrant issued upon oath of Peter G. Bridgman, who informed that one Joseph Smith of Bainbridge was a disorderly person and an imposter. Prisoner brought into the court March 20th, 1826. Prisoner examined. Says that he came from the town of Palmyra and had been at the home of Josiah Stoll in Bainbridge most of the time since. Had small part of the time been employed in looking for mines, but the major part had been employed by Seth Stoll on his farm and going to school. That he had a certain stone, which he had occasionally looked at to determine where hidden treasures in the bowels of the earth were. That he professed to tell in this manner where gold mines were at distance underground, and had looked for Mr. Stoll several times, and informed him where he could find those treasures. And Mr. Stoll had been engaged in digging for them. That at Palmyra he pretended to tell by looking at the stone where coined money was buried in Pennsylvania, and while at Palmyra, he had frequently ascertained in that way where lost property was, of various kinds, that he had occasionally been in the habit of looking through this stone to find lost property for three years, but of late had pretty much given up on the account of its injuring his health, especially his eyes, made them sore, that he did not solicit business of this kind, and had always rather declined having anything to do with this business. Josiah Stoll sworn, says the prisoner had been in his house something like five months, had been employed by him to work on the farm part of the time, that he pretended to have skill of telling where hidden treasures in the earth were, by means of looking through a certain stone. That prisoner had looked for him sometimes, once to tell him about the money buried on the Bend Mountain in Pennsylvania, once for gold on Monument Hill, and once for a salt spring, and that he positively knew that the prisoner could tell, and professed the art of seeing those valuable treasures through the medium of said stone, that he found the digging part at Bend and Monument Hill, as prisoner represented it, that prisoner had looked through said stone for Deacon Adelon, for a mine, did not exactly find it, but got a piece of ore which resembled gold, he thinks, that prisoner had told by means of the stone where a Mr. Bacon had buried money, that he and prisoner had been in search of it, that prisoner said that it was in a certain root of a stump, five feet from the surface of the earth, and with it would be found a tail feather, that said stole and prisoner thereupon commenced digging, found a tail feather, but money was gone, that he supposed that money moved down, that prisoner did offer his services, that he never deceived him. That prisoner looked through stone. That prisoner looked through stone and described Josiah Stoll's house and outhouses while at Palmyra. At Simpson Stoll's correctly, that he had been told about a painted tree with a man's hand painted upon it by means of said stone. That he had been in the company with prisoner digging for gold and had the most implicit faith in the prisoner's skill. Horace Stoll sworn. Says he see prisoner look into the hat through stone, pretending to tell where a chest of dollars were buried in Windsor, a number of miles distant. Marked out size of chest in the leaves on ground. A. Redstoll sworn. Says that he went to see whether prisoner could convince him that he possessed the skill that he professed to have, upon which prisoner laid a book upon a white cloth, and proposed looking through another stone, which was white and transparent. Hold the stone to the candle, turn his back to book, and read. The deception appeared so palpable that he went off disgusted. McMaster sworn. Says he went with A. Redstoll to be convinced of prisoner's skill, and likewise came away disgusted, finding the deception so palpable. Prisoner pretended to him that he could discern objects at a distance by holding this white stone to the sun or candle. That prisoner rather declined looking into a hat at his dark-colored stone, as he said it hurt his eyes. Jonathan Thompson says that prisoner was requested to look for yeomans for chest of money, did look, and pretended to know where it was, and that prisoner, Thompson, and yeomans went in search of it. That Smith arrived at spot first, was in night. That Smith looked in hat while there, and when very dark, he told how the chest was situated. After digging several feet, struck upon something sounding like a board or plank. Prisoner would not look again, pretending that he was alarmed the last time he looked. On account of the circumstances relating to the trunk, being buried, came all fresh to his mind. 
that the last time that he looked, he discovered distinctly the two Indians who buried the trunk, that a quarrel ensued between them, and that one of the Indians was killed by the other, and thrown into the hole beside the trunk, to guard it, as he supposed. Thompson says that he believes in the prisoner's professed skill, that the board which he struck his spade upon was probably the chest, but on account of an enchantment, the trunk kept settling away from under them while digging. That notwithstanding, they continued constantly removing the dirt, yet the trunk kept about the same distance from them. Says prisoner said that it appeared to him that salt might be found at Bainbridge, and that he is certain that prisoner can divine things by means of said stone and hat, that, as evidence of fact, prisoner looked into his hat to tell him about some money witness lost sixteen years ago, and that he described the man the witness supposed to taken it and disposition of money. And thereupon, the court finds the defendant guilty. So America will be reading off this next one. This is William D. Purple in 1877. In February 1826, the sons of Mr. Stowell, who lived with their father, were greatly incensed against Smith, as they plainly saw their father squandering his property in the fruitless search for hidden treasures, and saw that the youthful seer had unlimited control over the illusions of their sire. They made up their minds that patience had ceased to a virtue, and resolved to rid themselves and their family from this incubus, who, as they believed, was eating up their substance and depriving them of their anticipated patrimony. They caused the arrest of Smith as a vagrant without visible means of livelihood. The trial came on in the above-mentioned month before Albert Neely Esquire, the father of Bishop Neely of the state of Maine. I was an intimate friend of the justice and was invited to take notes of the trial, which I did. There was a large collection of persons in attendance, and the proceedings attracted much attention. The affidavits of the sons were read, and Mr. Smith was fully examined by the court. It elicited little but a history of his life from early boyhood, but this is so unique in character and so much of a keynote to his subsequent career in the world, I am tempted to give it somewhat in intenso. He said when he was a lad, he heard of a neighboring girl some three miles from him who could look into a glass and see anything, however hidden from others, that he was seized with a strong desire to see her and her glass, that after much effort he induced his parents to let him visit her. He did so and was permitted to look in the glass, which was placed in a hat to exclude the light. He was greatly surprised to see but one thing, which was a small stone a great way off. It soon became luminous and dazzled his eyes, and after a short time it became as intense as the midday sun. He said that the stone was under the roots of a tree or a shrub as large as his arm, situated about a mile up a small stream that puts in on the south side of Lake Erie, not far from the New York and Pennsylvania line. He often had an opportunity to look in the glass, and with the same result. The luminous stone alone attracted his attention. This singular circumstance occupied his mind for some years, when he left his father's house and with his youthful zeal traveled west in search of this luminous stone. He took a few shillings and money and some provisions with him. He stopped on the road with Farmer and worked three days and replenished his means of support. After traveling some 150 miles, he found himself at the mouth of the creek. He did not have the glass with him, but he knew its exact location. He borrowed an old axe and a hoe and repaired to the tree. With some labor and exertion, he found the stone, carried it to the creek, washed and wiped it dry, sat down on the bank, placed it in his hat, and discovered that time, place, and distance were annihilated, that all intervening obstacles were removed, and that he possessed one of the attributes of deity, an all-seeing eye. He arose with a thankful heart and carried his tools to their owner, turned his feet towards the rising sun, and sought with weary limbs his long-deserted home. On the request of the court, he exhibited the stone. It was about the size of a small hen's egg in the shape of a high instepped shoe. It was composed of layers of different colors passing diagonally through it. It was very hard and smooth, perhaps by being carried in the pocket. Joseph Smith Sr. was present and sworn as a witness. He confirmed at great length all that his son had said in his examination. He delineated his characteristics in his youthful days, his vision of the luminous stone in the glass, his visit to Lake Erie in search of the stone, and his wonderful triumphs as a seer. He described very many instances of his finding hidden and stolen goods. He swore that both he and his son were mortified that this wonderful power, which God had so miraculously given him, should be used only in search of filthy lucre, or its equivalent in earthly treasures, and with a long-faced, 
sanctimonious-seeming, he said his constant prayer to his Heavenly Father was to manifest his will concerning this marvelous power. He trusted that the Son of Righteousness would someday illumine the heart of the boy and enable him to see his will concerning him. These words have ever had a strong impression on my mind. They seem to contain a prophetic vision of the future history, that mighty delusion of the present century, Mormonism. The old man eloquent, with his lank and haggard visage, his form very poorly clad, indicating a wandering vagabond rather than an oracle of future events, has, in view of those events, excited my wonder, if not my admiration. The next witness called was Deacon Isaiah Stowell. He confirmed all that is said above in relation to himself, and delineated many other circumstances not necessary to record. He swore that the prisoner possessed all the power he claimed, and declared he could see things fifty feet below the surface of the earth, as plain as the witness could see what was on the justice's table, and described very many circumstances to confirm his words. Justice Neely soberly looked at the witness, and in a solemn, dignified voice said, Deacon Stowell, do I understand you as swearing before God, under the solemn oath you have taken, that you believe the prisoner can see by the aid of the stone, fifty feet below the surface of the earth, as plainly as you can see what is on my table? Do I believe it? says Deacon Stowell. Do I believe it? No, it is not a matter of belief. I positively know it to be true. Mr. Thompson, an employee of Mr. Stowell, was the next witness. He and another man were employed in digging for treasure, and always attended the deacon and smith in their nocturnal labors. He could not assert that anything of value was ever obtained by them. The following scene was described by this witness, and carefully noted. Smith had told the deacon that very many years before, a band of robbers had buried in his flat a box of treasure, and as it was very valuable, they had, by a sacrifice, placed a charm over it to protect it so that it could not be obtained except by faith, accompanied by certain talismanic influences. So, after arming themselves with fasting and prayer, they sallied forth to the spot designated by Smith. Digging was commenced with fear and trembling in the presence of this imaginary charm. In a few feet from the surface, the box of treasure was struck by the shovel, on which they redoubled their energies, but it gradually receded from their grasp. One of the men placed his hand upon the box, but it gradually sunk from his reach. After some five feet in depth had been attained without success, a council of war against the spirit of darkness was called, and they resolved that the lack of faith or of some untoward mental emotions was the cause of their failure. In this emergency, the fruitful mind of Smith was called on to devise a way to obtain the prize. Mr. Stowell went to his flock and selected a fine, vigorous lamb, and resolved to sacrifice it to the demon spirit who guarded the coveted treasure. Shortly after, the venerable deacon might be seen on his knees at prayer near the pit, while Smith, with a lantern in one hand to dispel the midnight darkness, might be seen making a circuit around the spot, sprinkling the flowing blood from the lamb upon the ground, as a propitiation to the spirit that thwarted them. They then descended the excavation, but the treasure still receded from their grasp, and it was never obtained. What a picture for the pencil of a Hogarth! How difficult to believe it could have been enacted in the 19th century of the Christian era. It could have been done only by the hallucination of diseased minds that drew all their philosophy from the Arabian Nights and other kindred literature of that period. But as it was declared under oaths in a court of justice, by one of the actors in the scene and not disputed by his co-laborers, it is worthy of recital as evincing the spirit of delusion that characterized those who originated that Prince of Humbug's Mormonism. These scenes occurred some four years before Smith, by the aid of his luminous stone, found the Golden Bible or the Book of Mormon. The writer may at some subsequent day give your readers a chapter on its discovery and a synopsis of its contents. It is hardly necessary to say that, as a testimony of Deacon Stowell could not be impeached, the prisoner was discharged and in a few weeks left the town. So I have this crazy idea that I want um, there to be a TV show about all this. And I think one of the... It would be really good. <laughs> it would be so good. But I want one of the titles, or the titles of the episodes, to reflect like the court cases and like I love this phrase the nocturnal labors and then this very like this one of the last lines in this where he says um the prince of humbugs mormonism I just think that's really funny <laughs> what interesting wording I'm like who wrote this the I pencil of it. a hogarth yeah like what is a hogarth <laughs> I don't know like it's, it's like did purple me. Did, purple must have written this right by William D purple so like 
Yeah, like he okay. just... Does he have any other books out? Because I feel like... <laughs> we I'm, should just, just read all his stuff. <laughs> it's very colorful wording. <laughs> I enjoyed it immensely, and I, I learned a lot yeah. from from reading this. Um, I was, like, the whole time just caught up in the story of it. It's just very colorful. Like, the only thing missing from this whole story is, like, who provided the drugs <laughs> <laughs> who where's the where's the the evidence that they were like half drunk like i don't know it's, it's just it's a beautiful story it just does not make a lot of um i guess non spiritual eyes sense well, this is the magic world view, so this is really what everyone was yeah, thinking about. Exactly. But so I have one more account that I want to read off. This last one is from the Morning Star, um, published November sixteenth, eighteen thirty-two, and the article is called Mormonism. So I am confused about this date because it's um, there's a warrant out for him on June thirtieth of eighteen thirty, which is a few months after the organization of the church. We know that he is no longer treasure digging. Um, but I guess it, it's, there's a difference between having a warrant out and being on trial because he was on trial, like in a physical courtroom in 1826. And this seems to be different. So I wonder if it's a separate thing altogether, if it has nothing to do with 1826. I don't know. That's, yeah, that's four years difference. Yeah, yeah. State of New York, Broome County, Joel K. Noble, Justice, The People versus Joseph Smith Jr., Samuel Dickinson, Complainant. The defendant was brought before me by virtue of a warrant on the 30th day of June, A.D. 1830, on a charge that he, the said Joseph Smith Jr., had been guilty of a breach of the peace against the good people of the state of New York by looking through a certain stone to find hid treasures, etc., within the statute of limitation. To the charge, the defendant pled not guilty. At the instance of the people, Joseph A. S. Austin was by me duly sworn and says, that he had been acquainted with Smith, the prisoner, for several years. The prisoner pretended to look in a certain glass or stone, and said he could tell where stolen goods were, and could discover mines of gold and silver underground, made some pretense at telling fortunes. But he, witness, never knew of prisoners finding anything by his pretended art. Once witness asked prisoner to tell him if he, prisoner, could tell anything by looking in said glass, and wished a candid and true answer. Prisoner told witness frankly, he could not see anything, and an answer prisoner likewise observed to witness anything you know for a living, says, two years before the present time, he saw a prisoner drink a certain quantity of distilled liquor, and was drunk, as he does believe, for he could not stand up, but lay in the woods for some hours. Harris Stoll, being by me sworn, saith, he has been acquainted with a prisoner for a number of years past. That prisoner said he could look in a certain stone or glass, and could tell where money and hid treasures were, and could tell where gold and silver mines and salt springs were, and that Smith, the prisoner, the pretended prophet and money digger, had followed digging for money, for salt, and for gold and silver mines for a number of years, that others, by his instigation, had followed digging, that at one time, witness hid a bag of grain in his barn, told Smith he had lost a bag of grain, and wished prisoner to find it. Prisoner looked in his glass in vain, for he could not find it. Prisoner, after using all his art for a number of days, offered to give witness his brother fifty cents, so his brother told witness to find where the grain was, and tell him, prisoner, unbeknown to witness, so that Smith the prisoner might have the credit of finding the grain. Cross questions. Says, he has not known the prisoner to look in the glass within the space of two years last past. Josiah Stoll, being by me sworn, saith he has been acquainted with Smith the prisoner for quite a number of years, that he did pretend to tell, by looking in a stone or glass, where money and goods and mines were in a manner particular to himself. The prisoner had followed digging for money, pretended to find mines, hid treasures and lost goods, and frequently others would be digging with him. Says that about three years since, prisoner was put under arrest by an officer at Bainbridge in Shenango County for breaking the peace, and that he escaped from the officer and went to Palmyra. And that about two years since, witness was at Palmyra and saw prisoner. That prisoner told witness that the Lord had told prisoner that a gold Bible was in a certain hill, that Smith, the prisoner, went in the night and brought the Bible, as Smith said. Witness saw a corner of it. It resembled a stone of greenish cast should judge it to have been about one foot square and six inches thick. He would not let it be seen by anyone. The Lord had commanded him not. It was unknown to Smith that witness saw a corner of the Bible, so called by Smith, told the witness the leaves were of gold. There were written characters on the leaves. Prisoner was commanded to translate the same by the Lord. And from the Bible got from the hill, as aforesaid, 
The prisoner said he translated the Book of Mormon. The prisoner put a certain stone into his hat, put his face into the crown, then drew the brim of the hat around his head to prevent light. He could then see, as prisoner said, and translate the same, the Bible, got from the hill in Palmyra, at the same time under a lock and in a chest. And the prisoner, when looking for money, salt springs, hid treasures, etc., looked in the same manner, did not know that prisoner could find money, lost, etc., and that prisoner told witness, after he was arrested in Bainbridge, he would not look for money, etc., anymore, told witness he could see into the earth, about forty or fifty feet, etc. Newell Knights, sworn, saith prisoner could see in a stone, as stated by Stuhl, that formerly he looked for money, etc., but latterly he had become holy and was a true preacher of the gospel of Christ, possessed the power of casting out devils. He knew it to be a fact, that he, Smith, the prisoner, had cast a devil from him, witness, in a manner following. Witness was in mind impressed. He and Smith did conclude and knew the devil was in witness. They joined hands, their faith became united. The devil went out of witness. Witness knew it to be a fact, for he saw the devil as he departed. Smith did it by the power of God, etc. A true copy from minutes taken by me on trial. Joel K. Noble, J. Peace. Dated Colesville, August 28, 1832. State of New York, Broome County, town of Colesville. Personally came before me, Joel K. Noble, Justice of the Peace of said town of Colesville. Preston T. Wilkins, known by me to be the same person, and being to me duly sworn, saith that Newell Knights did style himself a prophet of the Lord, and was ordained by Joseph Smith, Jr., the pretended author of the Book of Mormon. As the said Newell told him, this deponent, and this deponent understood so by others, that the said Newell was so ordained, that the said Newell told this deponent he knew past, present, and future, that in order to ascertain the prophetic ability of the said Newell, the deponent went and took from the father of said Newell a Mormon Bible, so-called, and be known to anyone, as this deponent believes, and buried it under his own doorstep, witnesses. In the morning the book was found. This deponent went to the aforesaid Newell, told him the mystery that had happened. The said Newell and father told this deponent it did not come from this package of books. They counted them and were certain, as they said. The aforesaid Newell told the deponent that God told him, the said Newell, that he had sent his angel to put the book under the doorstep, to convince him, this deponent, of the truth of the Mormon book, as also to warn him to flee from the impending wrath. Preston T. Wilkins, subscribed and sworn before me this 28th day of August, 1832. Joel K. Noble, J.P., a true copy from the original affidavit on file in my office. J.K. Noble, Colesville, August 28, 1832. Joseph Smith, Jr. was discharged. He had not looked into the glass for two years to find money, etc. Hence, it was outlawed. Okay, so America, had it, um, growing up in the church, had you he heard any of these stories before? I heard none of those, not a single one ever in my I, life before now. <laughs> I didn't either. In fact, yeah, like I, like I was shocked when the church produced pictures of the seer stone. And when they did, I was like, what the heck is this? And like, what does this have to do with anything? And so like, and I think that was in 2016. I can't remember what day that was. I don't, I don't think I was even aware of that happening, but that's besides the point. But yeah, no, I no. Although I did, I talked to my mom about this and she had heard about it way long time ago when she was grow, growing up in like the seventies. So maybe it was more, um, acceptable or known at that time. I don't know. I don't know. They just like threw it out there and people were like, yeah, okay. It was the seventies yeah. after all. Um, also, uh, this the story of um, Joseph Smith, the guy hiding the grain, and Joseph's like paying the guy fifty bucks to to Shady. tell him where it, to tell yeah. him where it is. I thought that was really funny. Also, it's interesting that Joseph Smith Senior on trial says that his son was like renowned for finding things through his seer stone, and I think that's super interesting. Um, also, it's interesting that they also say that he never found anything on his treasure digs, but yet all these people like genuinely believe that he was had this gift of of seeing things in the ground which just it just it's just really shocking that i don't know can i say the words confirmation bias is that oh allowed like, uh, um or i've heard um people say that faith is really resilient so like even if you're resilient yeah um what is it like if you tell somebody the opposite of what they believe, especially if it's true, they will just believe harder. So interesting how the mind does that. Another thing that I wanted to point out, which I thought was really interesting, is that Josiah Stoll at one point says that the plates were passed to him 
I think this might be the story of him passing it through the window of Joseph after he collects it from the woods. Although he doesn't say this in this account. So that might be something different. But anyway, he says that he sees the corner of the... I think it's a muslin sheet or something like that. A handkerchief that's covering the plates. And then the corner of it moves so he can see the corner of the plates. And he describes it as it was a stone of greenish cast. Which isn't gold. So like... Also not um, metal? Stone? Yeah. Like I I don't know. That, that whole description just is kind of throwing me off. Like what did he actually see? Like, um, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't sound anything like the golden plates that I grew up. Yeah, and gold doesn't tarnish, but also gold is also very soft. So, like, um, I know that people have a theory that it's made of tumbaga, which is, like, um, different materials mixed, different ores mixed with gold. Um, So, I have no idea. That's just was really interesting. Also, isn't there another story? I don't know if this is getting off topic, but the, the daughter of somebody who received them through a window... And if they were 50 pounds, there's just no way she would be able to... Yeah, Dan Volga brought that up, too. And I and see, I'm getting the story confused with that. Well, at one point, didn't go out the window and who did it go to? But yeah, 50 pounds is really heavy. And like with Emma even moving it around the house, mm-hmm. like that's just super heavy for her to do. And like... Yeah. Anyway, Especially but... Especially if she's a, a frail woman of the time. <laughs> well, we don't know that about her. <laughs> um, anyway, so thank you for joining with us as we discuss the trial of Joseph Smith. And I hope that hearing us read these kind of gives you a different picture of who the prophet was uh, before he started the church and what before he was a prophet before he was a prophet yeah and i just think i just think knowing these origin stories of joseph and and his followers just really paints a different picture a completely different picture yeah yeah anyway and a bit of beautiful like it's a beautiful picture they did a great it job is. okay yeah actually while you say that i'm glad you did so i wanted to put a plug in for mark elwood he illustrated this beautiful book called The Glass Looker. And he's basing it off of that, off of this trial. And he has so many different accounts just all over. Beautiful pictures. Go buy it. It's so good. It's gorgeous. We, um, we uh, were showing it to our little girl and she even was like, whoa. It's it's, It's a, it's a tiny bit graphic. um, In a couple of places. In a couple of places. Because like, like, but cartoon graphic, so... Yeah, so just just be warned that there's a couple of images like that we de- had to death scenes. Just well, they're well, not so even here, really death scenes. So in, in in one of these trials, they kill the sheep, and in another one in his book, they I think it's a rooster that they kill mm-hmm. uh, for part of this occultic um, ritual. Anyway, so yeah, there's just a little bit of blood, a little bit of blood, <laughs> but that's all. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for joining with us. We hope you guys have a great rest of your day. <laughs> Thanks for joining analyzing Mormonism. <laughs> <laughs>